The Connecticut Music Oral History Podcast is a deep dive interview series with musicians, artists, conduits, collectors, and dedicated fans, focusing on 20th century Connecticut music history. This project preserves narratives, heralds unsung movers and shakers, and defines Connecticut's influential role in cultural history. I'm your host, Brendan Toller. I'm an artist, a musician, a filmmaker, and marketing manager of the incredible Verso Studios at the Westport Library, where this very podcast is being produced. Verso Studios is a media resource and production hub, serving as an inclusive, empowered, future-forward cultural and learning center. A library branch of the 21st century, Verso Studios provides programming, commercial services, as well as educational and content creation opportunities. We have a state-of-the-art hybrid analog recording studio designed in part by Rob Fraboni, the same guy who built Keith Richards' home studio down the road. We record bands, artists, audiobooks, podcasts, and everything in between. We have video production suites, classes, and events. Check us out at the Verso Studios website and on social media. Hey everybody, this month's podcast features Verso Studios designer and consultant Rob Fraboni. Rob is a legendary record producer and audio engineer working with the likes of Bob Dylan, The Rolling Stones, Etta James, Bonnie Raitt, Melissa Etheridge, and many more. Rob has designed studios for the band and Keith Richards and served as vice president of Island Records in its heyday. We got very in-depth about so much we forgot to talk about how Rob ended up in Deer, Connecticut. Long story short, one night Keith Richards stretched himself out in the doorway of his house and insisted Rob move nearby. Let's dig into our conversation with Rob Fraboni. Let's start from the beginning. Of what was your first musical memory, you think? Oh, my first musical memory is uh, I'm from an Italian family. And so once a month, we would have a get-together at my grandma's house and, uh, or my mother's sister's house. And actually, it was at my mother's sister's house where in the back... In the garage, they had a thing set up to play music. So there would be like a table with about 20, 30 people, have this big meal on a Sunday afternoon, and then everybody go in the back and play music, right? So, you know, I was started to get into, I was like four, five, and I was kind of fascinated with the drums. It kind of caught my attention. So there's drums, accordion, of course, because we were Italians, um, saxophone, guitar. Yeah, that was kind of it, you know, maybe an upright bass or something. So anyway, so th- this would go on and I would pay attention. Now, my sister was 10 years older than me. So she was into Elvis and, you know, Buddy Holly and Little Richard and, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis and, you know, all of that. Bill Haley and the Comets, you know. though. And she was having dances in the garage at the house, at our house. And uh, I would, you know, so being 10, she's 10 years older, I was like five, six, you know, and I'd open that garage door and they'd be in there dancing. I thought, boy, this is the coolest thing I've ever witnessed, you know, and they were just having a blast, right? I thought, this sounds great, right? This, I mean, this seems great. So anyway, then, uh, and my dad had a really good Grundig Majestic stereo. He was really into sound. And and so that was really a high-end European, you know, top of the line thing at the time. And so anyway, uh, so I, and they were into records, so I was kind of into that. And then one day I was just sitting outside on the curb and and I was, I had a couple of sticks and I was kind of playing around. He came up to me, he said, he said, listen, he said, I'm gonna give you a choice. You can either get a surfboard or, or it looks like you want drums because he saw me messing around. He said, you can either get a surfboard or a set of drums. He said, what do you want, you know, and I, I just thought about it for a second, and I said, well, drums. And he says, okay, you know, so that's how it started, right? So I got drums, and then... Did you drive them insane, the played, drums? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, for, they, were, they were set up in the house for about an hour in the living room, and then they went out to the garage, you know. So anyway, so... Uh, and then um, what I used to do is I used to play to records, you know, to the radio, right? So I had a little radio out there, and so I'd play, and... I would just, you know, play along with whatever I was hearing. And so then um, at some point uh, at school, there were some other guys that were interested, you know, playing other instruments. And then we decided to form a band. And then, you know, we went from there. 
and we got to be pretty good. And we were, we, you know, we were covering the Rolling Stones. What and was the, the band called? Yeah, well, there was a bunch of them, but the one that we really got somewhere was called the Nobleman. The first one was called the Riptides, and it was surf music. And so I built the amplifier that we all plugged into. It was like, I have a picture of this somewhere, and it has the name of the band on the amp. I've got like a snare drum and a, probably a pie tin or something for a cymbal, you know, just like th those two things. And then, and then everybody's plugged into the same amp, you know, it's kind of hilarious. But anyway, so we did that and then, but we got better at it. We were called the Blues Union for a minute and then we became the Nobleman, right? So the Nobleman did pretty well and we won a battle of the bands. And then um, I was 15 at the time and uh, our, the grand prize was that you got paid to play a gig on Catalina Island on New Year's Eve. This was a big bloody deal. So this was 1966. And so um, on December 6th of 1966, I injured my hand really bad and, on a job. And I cut my tendons and my nerves and, and uh, I couldn't play for a year. And so that so much for the gig on Catalina and so I had been learning electronics from a friend of mine's dad that worked at an aerospace le uh, plant at, at Northrop. And so he, on Friday nights, had a blackboard in the garage. And he was teaching us electronics. And so when I couldn't play, the kind of the natural thing happened. The electronics and the music kind of got together, and I started recording my friend's bands. And so I had a little, you know, little two-track Roberts tape recorder, really cool tubes and, you know, and a little switchcraft, little four input switchcraft mixer, like little four little knobs on it. You could plug four mics in. So anyway, we would record, and so this is how it started. And then by the time I had to go through physical therapy and stuff, it was really bad. I mean, the, the injury. And so in any event, I never went back. I mean, I still play occasionally. I still have the drums I originally got, but but I got bit by the recording bug and then that was the end of that right so then I built a studio behind a friend of mine's parents ha house they had a guest house and so we made the living room into the studio the bedroom into the control room and we actually cut a record there called hot pants it wasn't James Brown's hot pants but it was sort of the same time as the, the act was called Hank Carbo and the off ramp and uh, it was an instrumental and we and and we pressed a forty five out of it and stuff, and we actually made a record in this little place, right? And so then um, I tried to get a job at a studio, and uh, you know, being that we lived in Los Angeles, I started hitchhiking to Gold Star when I was fifteen, and so I would sneak into the. They, I was told how you get in the back door, and I watched Phil Spector work. I watched, you know, Brian Wilson work there, and I, I, I saw Phil Spector work with the Righteous Brothers and Sonny and Cher. And Nobody ever said, hey. <laughs> no, because it was cool. The way the place was laid out, there was like a hallway, right? So what you would do is it was on Santa Monica and Vine, right? So there was an alley on this south of Santa Monica Boulevard behind Gold Star, right? So that door was always left unlocked, I was told, right? So when you open that door... There, literally, there was a straight line hallway that went from that back door to the front door that went out to Santa Monica Boulevard. So, and then that bisected the place. So Studio A was on the was on that side. Studio B was on this side. And then and then the the control rooms. Funny enough, didn't have a door to go between the control room and the studio. You had to go out into the hallway and then go into another door to go in the studio. There wasn't a door. Just funny, I guess, for sound or something. I don't know. But anyway, so the thing that would happen is. At six o'clock, the receptionist would go home. So there was this kind of a, a black, you know, vinyl couch with chrome handlebars over here on the right of the door. And then over there, there was a sink and a vending machine and, 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 uh, and a bathroom and whatever. And so I would sit on the couch and then whoever was working, nobody was out there but me. And then whoever would leave the one studio would see me sitting there and would think I was with the other session and then the reverse would happen and I never got thrown out. But the thing is, eventually, the guy, this guy, Doc Siegel, figured out that I, I was there with all these different clients and that didn't make any sense. You see what I mean? Like, after a few times, he's like, wait a second, you know. 
he says, I got your number, kid, you know, and then he ended up inviting me into the control room and like, you know, I was like, so flipped out, excited. I mean, I was just wanting to like look through the door, when the door opened, see the reels spinning on the tape machine and see the VU meters move. That was enough for me, right? At that point, I was so enthralled, you know. So anyway, so that was a big deal. Um, and that was very interesting. It, it played into things later because I remembered when I was in my early 20s and I was now made to use a bunch of microphones on a recording session, I used to think about those Phil Spector sessions and there would be like 20 people in the room and there was only 10 microphones. And I was just, and I, and when I was using 25 microphones on five people, I was thinking, gee, that's really different than what I used to watch, you know? And anyway, so I ended up going back to that method of recording, which I, you know, I started doing that about 25 years ago again. And that's fantastic anyway. But so anyway, so that was a big factor. Now I'd skipped two grades of school. And so I, didn't, I, also, I used to tell everybody I was two years older than I was, and I started to believe it myself, you know what I mean? And so, <laughs> so I started going to apply to jobs at recording studios, but it didn't dawn on me that they wouldn't hire me because I was too young. I, I, and so I couldn't get arrested. And so uh, my mother was psychic, and uh, she was in New York with my dad and called me, and uh, I was 17 at the time, and she said to me, uh, she, she used to call me Robbie. She said, Robbie, she said, you have to come to New York. She said, all doors will open for you in New York. I'll never forget those words, right? And so um, I was fascinated. I, I, we hung up the phone and there. I had a copy of Rolling Stone laying there. And uh, it was open to the back cover. And there's those little ads that are size of a postage stamp and there's one that said IAR Institute of Audio Research it was the only it was 1969 it was the only recording school in the world at that time literally like Al Grundy who started it used to import Shep's microphones into the United States interestingly enough but he was the most to this day he's the guy that was the most knowledgeable guy on audio I've ever met to this day never met anybody that equaled him so anyway so I I ended up I ended up uh, going to this school in New York, and that's what changed everything. And, and, and what my mom said was true. I, I stayed at the YMCA the first two days, and uh, I got a copy of The Village Voice, and I found an apartment on 125 West 16th Street, which unbelievable. I mean, the second day I was there, and, and I couldn't afford a phone yet, and so I was. I had this unemployment claim I was transferring. And I had to call places. So I went to the phone booth and I thought, well, I'm here to go to recording school. So I looked. There were yellow pages in the phone booth at the time. So I went to the recording studios, and the first three were uh, AAA, A1, and Atlantic. Right? Okay. So I called AAA, and they said, sorry, but you know, no, we don't have any openings. Right? And I called A1. Now A1 was Herb Abramson that started Atlantic with Ahmed Erdogan. He lost his part to Miriam, his wife, who was the bookkeeper in a divorce, right? So he had opened this studio called A1 Sound in the, in the Beacon Hotel next to the Beacon Theater. And so on the phone, he says to me, he says, uh, where are you? And I said, I, I'm in the village. He says, get on the subway and come up here and see me, right? So I got, so the, I mean, this is just all just happened the second day I was in New York. And so I went up there. He hired me. I mean, I kind of bullshitted my way through it. I'd never worked on a multi-track before, and I had just worked on a Revox, you know, going back, bouncing back and forth. The, the Roberts in the first place, and then the Revox, you know, doing mono, bouncing back and forth. And so anyway, so uh, I went, I got, and I, I got the job, and then, then I was at the school, and then I was, you know, going to the school, and I was in, and Jimmy Iovine, Jack Douglas, and myself were all in this class together at the Institute of Audio Research, right? And so, um, and so they're working at the record plant, they're second engineers. And there's this other guy, Dennis Ferrante, who he was the guy that was the, he, he and, and Skeeter were the head of the, the uh, Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stones mobile, the, the record plant mobile truck. And so anyway, Dennis says to me when we're at school one day after school, he said, listen, I'll you should come and apply for a job at the record plant. I said, well, that's where I want to work. You know, it was Jimmy Hendrix had just done Electric Ladyland there. It was like, it was the studio in the world. So I, I was like, well, that's where I want to work. And he said, yeah, I'll put your name in and, uh, you know, or, and yeah, go and see the person. And 
So I went and, and I filled out an application, but I had this rapidograph pen and I, and I, uh, I said, they had a form that you filled out. And I said to the lady, I said, listen, do you have a blank piece of paper? And she said, why? And I said, well, I, I'm just gonna do this by hand. I'm not gonna fill out that form, right? So, so I, I wrote out the, everything that was on the form and I did the whole thing and then, so that was that and I left and about two weeks later, I get a phone call from her and she says, uh, come, in, come in and see me, right? So I get there to the, I get to the record plant and so we're in her office and she reach, she opens this drawer of her desk and she pulls out this stack, it was about an inch high of these job applications and she said, I wanna show you something. And so she takes her thumb and she goes like this, you know, over with the edge of the thing and you see the things going by. And the only one that stuck out was mine because everything, they were all this printed form that everybody filled out, but mine was this white piece of paper that was written by hand. And so she said, uh, she said, uh, because you did that, that's why you're here. And I said, what? I said, D you mean Dennis Ferrante didn't tell you that I was com coming? No, Dennis didn't say anything to me. I said, that little punk. I said, he told me that, you know, anyway, then I got the job, right? And so that was that. And then, so then I got, I worked there for three months and then. What year would have this been? Early seventies? This was 69. 69. Wow. Yeah. 69 into 70. Um, and then, uh, but I had a, there was a strange thing that happened and um, J Jack Douglas was producing, was engineering his first record as the first engineer. And, um, and the client I remember was Gulf and Western. They had a record label at the time. And it was called the Ch Ch Chesapeake Jukebox Band. It was the name of the act. And so anyway, so um, so Jack was engineering. So the way the thing was set up, the engineer was sitting at the console, and he had the box with the ready record switches on it. And it had the you know the remote for the multi track, right? So he had that sitting next to him over here, right? Then I'm sitting on a stool next to the MCI tape machine, which is in the back corner, I'm sitting on the stool. So then he would say punch, you know, and I would punch in and stuff like this, right? But he controlled which tracks were in record, not me. I didn't have the remote, he did, right? So what happened was he put the wrong track in record. I punched in and I erased this choir and, and, and you know, expensive session, right? And so I come to work the next day and so I, I and it, it, there was, the offices were on the 10th floor, so the, there were two studios on the on the first floor, and then the, the Studio 3 was upstairs, and that's where the offices were, right? So I get in and see the receptionist, and she says, oh, listen, they're having a meeting up in Chris Stone's office. He was the studio manager, and they, they want you to come up there right away. And I thought, I wonder what that's about, right? So I walk in there. There's the clients, the producers. There's Jack Douglas. There's Roy Sakala, the chief engineer and Chris Stone, the studio manager, and now me. And it looks pretty serious, right? So I sit down and they said, uh, Chris Stone says to me, Rob, he says, you, you made a grave error. And I, I said, I did? I said, what did I do? And he said, well, you erased a choir off of their tape yesterday. And I said, I erased a choir? I said, I didn't know. I said, I just sit there and hit when he says punch, I punch. And and then he's trying to tell me to shut up, Chris Stone, you know, in front of the client, you know what I mean? He's like, Rod, that's enough. You know, he said, I'm sorry, but you know, just you're fired, you know, just like that in front of the client, you know, just try to, you know. So anyway, Jack Douglas, I mean, not Jack Douglas, I mean, Jack Adams, who started the record plan with Gary Kelgren originally, and I got to be super close, right? Kelgren was in Los Angeles. They had, they had built the record plant in L.A. So Kelgren was in L.A. Jack Adams was still the owner that was in New York, right? So basically, Chris Stone worked for him. But in any event, Jack went ballistic. I mean, when they fired me, and, um, and he rode his motorcycle into the studio, like into a session. He, he had a Harley, you know, and he, he literally rode the thing in there, and he was, you know, right into a session. You know, he was like freaking, he would just kind of make creating havoc, right? Like that was going to do any good. He was a bit of a, you know, wild card, as you can tell by that. But in any, in any event, 
it was too late. I mean, I couldn't go. I I couldn't stand Chris Stone in the first place. The guy that I loved though was Roy Sakala, and he was the chief engineer. He's he did Imagine with John Lennon, and you know Roy was Roy and I were very close and stayed close until he passed away. But in any event, um, so that was the end of that. And uh, but I had another job. I had two other jobs. At, at, uh, I was working two studios at once when I was at when I was at the record plant. Um, I was just working the one, but then I had this other, when I was working at A1, I had, there was another place called Advantage Sound where I, it was on 54th and 8th and, and I met Gary Cannon there, C-A-N-N-O-N, who was actually Gary Katz that produced Steely Dan. And so when I was at the Village Recorder years later, I'm looking at this work order and it says for the Steely Dan, who nobody knew who that was, session, and I see Gary Katz and I thought, man, and there, they, who walks through the door? Gary Cannon. And I was like, no way. And, he, and, and he, he said, yeah, I went back to my real name, you know. And so anyway, so uh, anyway, that was a small world deal. So anyway, I, I continued to work in New York for like two years. And I went to visit my parents on, this was 1971 for Christmas. And um, when I was leaving to go back to New York, I, I used to love the idea of the Village Recorder because it was in, West Los Angeles. It wasn't in Hollywood, which I thought was like a ghetto. And uh, I thought, how cool a studio near UCLA and, you know, this whole thing. And so anyway, so Eric Clapton had done his first solo record there. And I saw, that's where I saw recorded Village Recorders, uh, you know, Westwood, California. And I saw, I went looking for the place and found it and had a mural at the Fool, the people that did that Apple offices in London, George Harrison's friends and everybody that, Incredible string bands, friends, the fool, the artists. They painted that mural on the wall of the Village Recorder, and it's kind of like famous for that and everything else. So anyway, I went in there and applied for a job, and of course I was turned down because I was too young again, right? So that was before I moved to New York, and then, so then um, when I went to visit my parents in '71, so now I'm 20, right? And so anyway, so I go by this village, and for the fun of it, I was going to go to the airport, and I thought, oh, I'm going to go put another job application in there, right? So I did, and then two weeks later, when I was back in New York, New York, Jordy Hormel called me, and he said, I, I like your job application, and he, he you know, because I had done, I didn't do, Dennis, uh, Dennis, uh, Jimmy, and, um, and Jack Douglas all took, it was called, uh, uh, studio technology and practice. It was the course number 101, right? So I took course number 102. They left and I stayed and took audio systems design. And so that was the, that first course lasted like six weeks. The audio system design lasted three months, right? So when I ended up, when Jordy Hormel called me and offered me this job, I said, I said to him, uh, well, let me think about it, and and uh, and you know I'll give you a call back. And he says, he said, yeah, you could think about it. He said, I'll give you ninety seconds. And and I I said what? He said, yeah. He said, you know, you're gonna have to decide right now. And so I said, okay, I'll take it. Right. I don't know what made me do that, but I did. And so because I did, I really liked being in New York. But anyway, so. Anyway, back to California, and then the first thing that happened was they had bought a new console. And um, the Studio C upstairs where Sly Stone did Family Affair, that, that the, there's a riot going on. He did that record up there in this little tiny room, smaller than, the, I mean, really small, like a bed, like a, a medium-sized bedroom. And um, anyway, um, and we put this new console up there, and I did, and so I was made to, oh, I was hired as the chief of maintenance. That was the odd job opening, and I took it, you know, because I had the technical expertise at that point. So... In any event, um, I designed the whole studio up there, did all the run sheets, did the whole thing, you know, locked myself in a friend of mine's apartment for four days so nobody could find me and, and called Al Grundy and said, Al, I'm going to have a bunch of questions for you, you know, and it, and it worked perfectly, perfectly. Like we, I mean, there was this really, this guy named Mike Ringrose that was this, that read comic books all day. He had like 173 IQ or some craziness. He was like this genius guy. And he was this incredible wiring guy, you know, really great. So anyway, he he wired the entire place. I did the run sheets, and we did not have a single, not one wire out of place. It worked perfectly right away. 
So that went a long way towards a lot of things for me. And then the next thing I knew, three months after I'd started working there, Jody Hormel called me up one day, called me in his office one day. He said, listen, he said, I want to make you the chief engineer. And I was like, really? You know? Yeah, because the Doc Siegel, the guy who used to invite me into Gold Star, was the chief engineer. And he had a heart attack. And so... He was the guy, and that's one of the other reasons I went back to apply there because I saw an ad in Billboard magazine for Village Recorder. That's right, before I went to see my parents, there was a picture of Jordy Hormel and Doc Siegel and, and a bunch of the engineers and stuff. And, and uh, even Carol Farhat, the person that took my job application, was in that thing. It was like nine pictures, and I thought, well, this looks kind of cool. And I said, Doc's at the Village Recorder. That's why the other reason I went there. Anyway, so I got hired, and then I ended up taking his job, and I became chief engineer, and then the rest is history. And then after that, you know, I was there. I, st I started there. I, right after I was chief engineer, the Beach Boys came in, and, and uh, I ended up working with them and did Sail on Sailor. And then, you know, everything went at bing, bing, bing after that. It was Joe Cocker came in, and I did You're So Beautiful with him. And then Bob Dylan and the band came in, and that was kind of funny because I, Jeff Picaro and David Page were very close friends of mine, and they were like 16 and 17 years old at the time, or 17 and 18 or something. And they had just played on a Seals and Crofts record called Diamond Girl, and it was a number one record, right? Number one. And so um, they called me up and said, listen, Rob, you know, we had been working together. Joe Shermie, the bass player from Three Dog Night, who was amazing, was good friends of theirs, and he was doing this record at the village, and that's how I met uh, Jeff and David, and we had a blast working together. And so, anyway, um, they said, you know, we've been talking to Seals and Cross about you, and they they're into you engineering the record, right? And I was, wow, number one coming off a number one record, wow, you know, I was my eyes were like, I was had stars in my eyes. So anyway, so, so I hear that Bob Dylan's coming into the village, but. I liked Bob Dylan and everything, but I was more about this number one record, right? So I was ready to, to not do, you know, work. Uh, you know, I was the one that got to choose who woke, worked with who. <clears throat> and then five days later, I found out the band was coming in with Bob Dylan, and I almost fainted. I was, it was my favorite band of all time, right? I was just like, no way. I mean, and so that was the end of the Seals and Cross project. And so... Anyway, so I did Planet Waves, and then um, and then the Stones came in, and Goat's Head Soup, that was two weeks. They had been recording in Jamaica, and, uh, and they needed to escape, you know, some, they had to escape somebody um, at, at the time, and so we won't name the person. So anyway, and then uh, they, so they came there for two weeks, and that, and that's how Keith and I became best friends. But that was just a, a fluke, you know, because I might have never seen him again. But my friend rented a house next door to him in Jamaica. And I went to Jamaica and I met and saw Keith. And then we became friends and the rest is history there. And then I did uh, No Reason to Cry with Eric Clapton. So those five records, five records in a row between, well, over about a 20-month period. And... Um, so the last one, actually the last one, I had a little bit out of order. Planet Ways was the last of those five. No, 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 I'm sorry. Eric Clapton was the last, but um, Goat's Head Soup was before Planet Waves and then, and then Eric Clapton's record. And then, so then I got invited to go on the tour with Bob Dylan and the band in 1974. And I went on this tour and I actually was on the plane with them and David Geffen and Bill Graham. How that happened, I'll never know. <laughs> I wasn't on the crew bus, you know, I was like, unbelievable, right? So anyway, so uh, I was a liaison between the band and the front of house mixer. That was my job, like a consultant. It was incredible. I ended up doing that for the Stones for three different tours later down the line. I was the first person that ever did that job in the world. I, you know, it didn't exist. But anyway, so um, what happened there was I went on this tour and then what I met all these people because Bob Dylan hadn't been on the road for eight years and everybody that was anybody came to those shows. I met everybody in the music business, every actor and actress you'd ever want to meet. I was running in the bathroom with a little spiral notebook, taking notes, trying to remember everybody's names that I read. I mean, literally, I had one of those little things fit in your shirt pocket with a little spiral thing. I'm in there writing down names. I'm just like, unbelievable, right? So 
anyway, when I got back, um, I, I went back to the village for about a month, and then Rick Danko found Shangri-La. Rick Danko was the one that found Big Pink, coincidentally, right? And so anyway, so he found this house, and Robbie called me, said, we want to put a studio in a house in Malibu. He said, uh, you know, we love working with you, and he said, you did, you've did, done, you done some nice work at the, designing the rooms at the village. He said, uh, you want to just design it and build it and do it with us? And I said, yeah, you know, so anyway, I left the village, and we did Shangri-La, and so that was that. And then, so that was going to be a year, you know, that was 1975, and so... We did Northern Lights, Southern Cross there. We did uh, we did the uh, the post stuff, some of the post work and the interviews for the last waltz there. And we did the basement tapes, not the original recordings, but when we put Working it out on, on them, yeah. Columbia, you know, the, the cleaning up of it and assembly of it. We did those things there, and the year was up, and we did it had a lease option for a year. And uh, Robbie said, well, that's it. We're done. And I said, oh, wait a minute. We're not done. I mean, because, you know, the thing is, it was the band and it was like, you know, to, it was so exclusive. And, and, and so, you know, people would come and visit Van Morrison and Joni Mitchell and Neil Young. And I could go on and on and on. And, and all these people would come in there and go, wow, what a great place, you know. So I said to Robbie, I said, Jesus, I said, you know, I'm sure we can keep this thing booked. No problem. I said, I want to keep it. And he said, have at it. You're welcome to it, right? And so the the road manager for the band, they owed him money. And so we had leased the equipment from the village recorder and we ended up ended up buying the equipment at the end of the lease. And so they gave Larry Samuels, who was my partner, I had two other partners. One guy bought the real estate. Larry had this gear. I designed the place and used it all the time. So they were their three equal partners. And so anyway, so Larry got the equipment from them and we ended up keeping it for 10 years. And then uh, and then I was going to quit the music business. Um, uh, Bonnie Raitt got dropped by Warner Brothers on Pearl Harbor Day in 1984. Lenny Warnker called her. Her deal was too rich. You know, she was getting a million dollars a record and they decided they wanna, didn't want to go through with it. And I was fed up with... A lot of things and the digital audio thing was coming and I was just kind of like, so I took, I, I decided to take a year off and I did research on Nikola Tesla for a year and I wanted to get a screenplay to happen. And, uh, and then Jack Nicholson told me that Jersey Kaczynski, the guy that wrote Bean there, Jack said to me, Rob, he says, you know, Jersey's working on a Tesla screenplay so that you should know that. And I thought, yeah, well. Okay, you know, so, and then the next thing you know, like the next week, I get a call from Chris Blackwell, and he says, uh, we had met in 1975 at the Roxy when Bob Marley and the Whalers played a five-day stint at the Roxy, and um, so um, he, we met that day, it was it was in June of 1975, and so, anyway, um, but then we didn't really see each other again. And then this is like t 10 years later. So he calls me, he says, listen, I just screened every music film that's ever been made. And he said, nothing even comes close to the last waltz. He said, sound wise, et cetera. He said, would you be interested in doing this movie with me? I'm doing Washington DC. And so I said, sounds interesting. And he said, so, okay, I'm gonna fly you to DC, let's meet. We had about a 45 minute telephone conversation. And then I went to meet him. We hit it off like crazy, and then I was there for four months and, and you know, supervising the music for it. I even did the last two weeks with the Nagra and the Fishpole because the guy, the movie ran over and the guy was booked, and I even did that. And then anyway, we went and did post-production in Los Angeles, and, um, and then when that was done, um, he called me up one day, and he said, on a Sunday, and he said, come by the hotel and see me. He said, um... I want to talk to you about something. So I go over there and he said, listen, would you be interested in helping me get my record company together? That's the way he put it, right? And I said, well, yeah, I guess. And he said, well, I said, what does that mean? He said, well, you know, I, I think what it means is I'd like you to just be my right-hand person. He said, I'll give you the office next to me. He said, and, uh, and uh, let's just, let's do this. And he said, are you interested? And I said, 
Yeah. And so he said, okay, we'll just, you know, go home tonight and write down on a piece of paper on one page of a legal pad what you want. And they said, we'll meet at the movie lot tomorrow morning. And so we got it was this early call, like seven o'clock in the morning. And so took the piece of paper. He had a red pen, made check marks next to it. There's like 11 things, you know, wanted an office, wanted an assistant, you know, how much money I wanted, various things, expenses. He wrote reasonable next to expenses and he put little red check marks next to everything. And he hands the paper back to me. He says, okay, here's your contract. He said, so... He said, next time you're in New York, give this to Art Yeager. He was the head of business affairs. And he said, tell him that this is your contract. And that was typical Blackwell style. Instead of him giving it to him, I gave it to him. Right. So anyway, so anyway, so that was that. And then I ended up being vice president of Ireland for five years until he sold it to Polygram. So that was, that's basically the gist of it. I mean, along the way there, you know, I produced a bunch of records and I did produce records for Island. I did put, I was the executive producer of Melissa Etheridge's record. Uh, and I, uh, that first record, I remastered Bob Marley's catalog when that went from Island to Tough Gong. They, they started to, this is before it got sold, right? But I did that. I remastered uh, Joshua Tree, the U2 album, um, because Bob Ludwig and I were friends, and he said to me that they sent him the, they sent him the the, uh, the tapes, and they they t told him that he could absolutely do nothing, and he uh, he could just transfer it to disc, and <clears throat> that's it. And um, and so he calls me, and he says, Rob, you know you need to come and see me. I got to show you something. So the tones were all screwed up that were on the U2 tapes. And so I said to him, uh, he said, I've got strict orders that I can't touch this. And I said, well, let's listen to it, right? And we listened to it. And then I said, okay, now let's, let's compensate for those tones and then listen to it again. And then and so that's what we did, and it sounded better. I mean, and it was like, and I just said, don't tell them anything. Let's just do this. And, you know, so we did, and that's what we did. And then and then the, the, the Addicted to Love story is really good. So, all right, so now I would get, I had this, uh, I had these, these Tannoy Gold speakers in the, what were called Belvedere cabinets, and, um, they weren't Lockwoods, which were the famous Robert Lockwood. Lockwood, Sir Robert Lockwood was the guy at, at EMI that, at Abbey Road that he designed a cabinet and they used to put the town speakers in these Lockwood cabinets. They were like a big deal. They were like the equivalent of the 604Es over here, which those little crappy Yamahas are sort of an emulation of a 604E in a weird way. So anyway, anyway, so um, I had these Tannoys and I, and, what I would do is I would take the tone controls on my stereo and I'd put them up full, full bass, full treble, just for the hell of it, and then and see what something sounded like, just to see if there's anything extreme going on. And I noticed on the Robert Palmer record that when I turned the bass up full, the record sounded unbloody believable. And and so, you know, and God bless you, Robert, wherever you are, um, you know, and E.T. Thorngren. I, maybe you're still with us, but uh, they were doing tons of blow and, and, they, and it, it affects the way you hear bottom end. And so anyway, the record had no bottom end on it, basically. And so much like Jamaican tapes, you know, like Jama records made in the studio in Jamaica, they love bass so much, they have the bass cranked up on the speaker so much that no bass gets onto the tape. Because when I remastered the Bob Marley catalog, there were songs where I was adding like, you know, 10 dB at 100 cycles to make it match the vinyl records that came out, right? I was like, no way. So anyway, so with Addicted to Love, it just it just was so amazing with this bottom end. And I called Chris. I said, Chris, you're not going to believe this. I says, but I said, you know, I've got, I do, and I told him about what I do. And he said, Chris, that's funny. Cause he said, I, I do that. And I said, well, try it with a, try it with Robert's record. And he was, and he called me back. He said, Oh my God. And so I went to the next day to, with Bob Logan and mastered addicted to love the single and added a shitload of bottom to it. I don't remember how much. And anyway, the record went to number one <clears throat> and uh, we had this big party at the palladium 
And um, Donnie Wynn played drums on half the record, and Tony Thompson played on the other half. And so, anyway, so Donnie Wynn shows up at this party. It was on my birthday, funny enough, and it was the, and it was the number one, celebrating being number one. And Donnie Wynn w- comes in, and he says to me, Rob, I said, I just heard Addicted to Love on the radio in the cab on the way over here. And he said, did that get remixed? And I said, um, I said, no. I says, but it is different and, than the album. And he said, no kidding, it's amazing. And I said, really, huh? You like it? Yeah, do I like it? He said, what happened? And I told him, and I said, listen, will you do me a favor? I said, so Robert Palmer and I were, became really good best friends, right? And he was a control freak, right? So the fact that I did something without telling him was not okay, right? So I thought, how am I, I always wondered how I was going to break this to him. So Anyway, I said to Donnie, come with me, will you? So we find Robert. And I said, I said, Robert, I said, you know, congratulations and blah, blah, hi, you know, blah, blah. And uh, I said, listen, Donnie's got something to tell you. And, he, and so he tells him about hearing it in the cab on the way over. And then he says to him that, you know, tell him the whole story and that he asked me if it was remixed. And then I told Robert and, and, and he, he kind of gave me this fake, pissed off look and then he got this big grin and he gave me a big hug and he says all right you know <laughs> so that solved that problem so anyway so yeah so I had fun with all that with Island and then I I was oversaw Compass Point for the whole time I was there you know in, the, in Nassau Terry Manning came in after when Chris sold Island to Polygram Terry came in to run the place after that and then eventually closed but Terry was great but anyway um yeah, so that's p- pretty much the story. And so during along the course of the way, like I said, I was an independent producer the whole time. And then, you know, while I had Shangri La and everything, and then I got to see well, how things operated on the other side of the fence, which was very interesting when I went to Ireland. It was all my worst fears were confirmed, you know, like you mean about the what happens when you hand a record in and how it gets marketed oh. and promoted and. You know what I found out? I mean, this is crazy. Okay, so Island's one of the largest independents, just below A&M at the time, right? So Atlantic's distributing Island. So there was like a 350, between 350 and $500,000 spent a month promoting, marketing and promoting. That was the marketing, marketing promotion budget per month for the island releases. And there were six to eight records that came out every month, right? Well, guess what I find out the first marketing meeting, which was on the first Wednesday of every month, that the whole budget goes on one record. And the other six, five, seven records, zero. I don't mean a thousand dollars, I mean zero. The whole budget went on one record. And so after the meeting, I said to Chris, I said, Chris, what is this? He said, it's called prioritization. He said, uh, he says, we're not big enough where we can, he says, but really, so the majors do the same thing. He said, the bulk of their budget goes on, maybe they'll do on two or three records, he said, because they can afford to. He said, us, one. He said, so that's it. And, and I said, well, how does something get prioritized? And he said, well... He said, let's, let, he said, let's think of it this way. He said, so Paul McGinnis, who managed you too, right, calls me up and says, Chris, I've got a band I want you to hear, right? So he comes in and he plays me this music and he says, uh, you like it? And Chris says, uh, he says, well, I'm, I'm not going to sign it if I don't like it, but yeah, I like it and I sign it. He said, well, guess whose record gets prioritized that when that comes out? <laughs> you know, I mean, duh, he manages you too. So anyway, that was the hard, cold truth. And um, that was very disconcerting. Um, but I found out anyway. And uh, yeah. And then from, so then, in, from, and then people would ask me to build studios. And so I've built about a dozen studios over the years now. And so this one here at the Westport Library was, this came through a guy that was running the Suzuki school, school Andrew Smith. And, um, and he introduced me to Bill, and uh, they didn't have the kind of budget that, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking about the most expensive studio I ever built. Um, <clears throat> it was at the Village Recorder. We, 
we spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars on the room that that was before a piece of equipment went in there. Um, that was probably a half a million seven fifty for that room. So anyway, so the idea here was we didn't have that kind of money, and I knew how to do this very efficiently, and um, I just you know it, it all worked out. And then I knew a guy that did video work, and and he designed the video room and. Yeah, so it was kind of a labor of love. I was I did it as a donor over a eighteen month period, I think it was, and um, and it worked out well. I loved the idea, and God bless Bill Harmer for you know having this vision for this place. Period. Right? I mean, putting the books downstairs and making it a multiple use room, and very visionary. I mean, great forward thinking, and I think going to be a model for libraries around the world. I mean. As time goes on. Could you talk about, you were mentioning it before I record, could you talk about some of the components that make up this room that we're in right now? The, the baffling, the carpet? Yeah, the, well, the, well, actually they're diffusers. but um, oh, diffusers, excuse me. Well, you know, the, 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 uh, the idea was, see, we had, to, we had to go kind of round and round a little bit before we agreed upon which space was going to be this control room. And then nobody could kind of get it through their head at first that they wanted to call this the studio. And I said, no, 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 this is the control room. I said, you know, so the studio will be like that, the big hall, or, you know, there's that other room back there, whatever it's called. Kamansky room. Yeah. yeah. So that, I said, you know, we should wire that up and that would make a good, a really nice studio. And I said, and we could put diffusers in there and it would acoustically be terrific. And, you know, it can be used for, you know, multiple purposes Etc. So we landed on this. So th so we didn't do any. I said to you, you can leave the walls the way they they've been designed. They can be parallel. I said you know that I said soundproofing is of course important. I says but basically we can build diffusers. They can be hung like paintings, and they can be hung from the ceiling. I, and then the idea so that solved the acoustics. And then we left the concrete floor and just put this large throw rug down. And that works great. There's meant to be another one up there, but that's not there yet. But the carpet's 100% wool because... Yeah, the carpet's 100% wool because of the static electricity that, that synthetic fibers create, and you don't want that. And that's... You know, there's little things like that that people don't realize, but in any event, then the idea was to be have a situation where you had a hybrid digital analog situation. So because education was a big part of this idea... And so you you wanted to sort of have the best of both worlds and have an integrated. So this this little particular SSL console, I had worked on it on one of these up in Canada. I was never a big SSL fan, honestly, but actually I prefer this console to the big you know computer oriented one that's the popular ones, the S and the G series and stuff like that, the E series and the G series. I mean, but but. Um, this thing sounds really good because it's simpler and it's got a lot, it's got a, you know, the, the problem with the SSLs were that when they came out, they were okay. They weren't a Neve sound wise, they, but they were good. And, but then they started using cheap components and, um, you know, just because the company grew so fast and, and uh, then these cheap capacitors, which was the the bane of the whole situation, you know, so people have taken an SSL console and changed out every electri electrolytic capacitor. And the, it's amazing what it does for the sound of it. Well, the fortunate thing about this one is that it doesn't have all that, you know, it's, it's real basic and simple and it interfaces with digital really well. So I thought that was the perfect thing for the, for this use of, of, you know, using it as a studio and also using it as an education situation a classroom if you will i thought that's the perfect thing and then and then some of the other gear i chose the the inward connection stuff they happen to be my favorite um steve furlot i think is one of the greatest audio designers that's ever lived and and uh right alongside rupert neve and that there's a tree audio piece over there and i was it was myself and a friend of mine in houston that suggested that Steve build a console and that gave birth to Tree Audio because there was no Tree Audio console. He, bi he built a one-off for, for um, Flea in 1982 and uh, that was the only console he had built that 
or at least that anybody knew about. And then he was making the 500 modules, but he also had a thing called the VAC rack, and that, that's the first time I ever used his equipment, and I couldn't. I thought it was the best piece of equipment I'd ever used, hands down. I was just like, this is, what is this? And I mean, so I called him, introduced myself. We had mutual friends. We got to be really friendly. I bought a bunch of the 500 modules, and then I was with this wealthy guy in Houston making a record, and then he said, God, I just love this stuff. Could we get this guy to build a console? And then I called Steve. He said, absolutely not. And then Dar kept throwing money at him until he finally gave in, and he, and then Tree Audio was formed. And so that's what's in here. You got that Tree Audio branch, and you've got this inward connection stuff, and then some, you know, iconic pieces, the 1176s and the pull tech. And in any event, you know, the, it's, it, it works really well and it's, uh, and it, and it, it didn't break the bank, you know, and, uh, and it'll continue to work well. And it's, and it's the kind of place that could be upgraded as necessary, depending on what the needs are and stuff like that, you know, so. You, I'm happy with the you said something in that stretch there. You said, uh, you know, people overlooking details. I feel like you're very detail oriented, and that's probably what your success part well, and be, I mean, being able to communicate that. It's, yeah. yeah, that's part of it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. See, Al Grundy, this is very interesting. Okay, Al Grundy, like I said, was the most knowledgeable guy. So he says to us one day, so we, this class was taken at, at the conference room at a Howard Johnson's with a blackboard, right? And we went, and over the course of six weeks, we went to a studio four times. That's it. I mean, so we're with a chalkboard and books and four times in a studio, right? So we didn't, we weren't put in front of a piece of equipment and and told, you know, this is how you work this piece of equipment. We were learning how a compressor worked, didn't matter which compressor. So you could sit in front of any compressor, you know, which was really great, right? So we really learned. I mean, like you did, like you know, and you go to full sale of these other things. It's not like that at all. But anyway, so here I'm just going to give you an example about details. So Al Grundy says one day, he says to the class, he says, he says, does anybody in here know why this particular connector he holds up an XLR? Why this is called an XLR? And of course, nobody did. And he says, well, he said, I'm going to tell you the story behind it. He said, so, so he said. This was invented in 1961 by Cannon Electrical in the United Kingdom. And he said, and so, and he draws the pin one, pin two, and pin three. <clears throat> and he said, then he writes XLR, right? So he says, this is British terminology. He said, X is universally accepted as ground. That's pin one. Pin two is L for live, L-I-V-E, British terminology again for positive or plus. And R is return for negative, you know, or minus. And so basically, that's where the name comes from. Now, I have asked everybody on earth that I've met if they know what XLR means. I have never met one person. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there were a dozen people in that class, and you might think, you know, I don't think Jimmy or Jack even remembered, but I remembered. And so anyway, the point is, what happened, what Al explained was that the a, the Audio Engineering Society got that connector in their hands, right, in the United States, and they looked at the connector, and there's pin one, pin two is next to it, and pin three is down by itself on the bottom, right? So somebody just arbitrarily says, well, everybody agrees that pin one is ground. So the one next to pin one, that'll be negative, and that one that's down there by itself will be plus, which is exactly the opposite of what the English did. So you don't understand the problems this caused. I mean, so the United States was pin three hot and the rest of the world was pin two hot. And so if when stuff went, equipment went back and forth, the polarity got flipped on everything. And so a lot of people don't get what that means. And, and the best way to describe that is, okay, you take a microphone and you stick it in front of a bass drum, right? And you record that bass drum. And now you play that bass drum back and you have a speaker. Now, when the bass drum hits, you want the paper cone to come towards you, right? Like the drum head would. But if the polarity is reversed, it goes in instead of out. And I said, and therein lies the problem. And I said, and then the other thing is, is that if you've got, you know, 10 microphones set up 
and three of them are backwards, you're going to have these, all these cancellations going on wherever the sound is common to those microphones that, that are different pin configurations. I said, you got a real issue on your hands here. And I mean, see, and the thing is, like when I was young, I never forget this. I was doing a mix and I, and I, and I, it was with that guy, Joe Shermie and, and, um, from three dog night. And I, I'll never forget this. And I'm doing this mix and it's like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm in those days, you know, you'd work on a mix all day, you know, eight hours, whatever it is. And so anyway, and so I got it just where I like it. And I think to myself, I'm going to turn the, I, I'm going to turn the bass up and I take the bass fader and I turn it up and the bass goes down and I'm, and I'm like tired at this point and stuff like that. And I'm just like, what? You know, and I'm, pu I'm I'm pushing it up and it's going down in volume, and and then and I pull it down and it doesn't go up in volume and I'm thinking what is going on, right? So I just freaked out, and shut the bloody thing down. I just went home, right? And so then, the next day I came in fresh, and so I thought, now this is too weird, you know. So I've got a little piece of tape with a little mark on it where I've had the base. So now I'm pushing it up and it's and it's going down. I'm pulling it down and it's going down. And uh, but it's kind of going up a little as I'm pulling it down. But it's like two things are happening at once. So what? Anyway, come to find out all these years later that when I learned about polarity, that that's what was going on. That was a Countryman Direct box that was pin three hot. All the microphones were pin two hot, pretty much. And so it was canceling. So, but what I figured out that day was if I kept pushing it up and I, but I more than I would have, it started to get louder once I hit that threshold of the cancellation threshold. Right. So that's what I did that day to do the mix. And I left it like that. Right. But then all those years later, I found that out. But I mean, there are so many things like that. So many amazing little things that people don't realize that I mean, I'll give you, I'll tell you another one that unbelievable. So I'm working, I'm at working at the record plant with Tom Fly. Tom Fly's the engineer. He and he and Ed McLean produced. Uh, I mean, he and and Don Freeman, Ed Freeman produced Don McLean's American Pie, right? Okay. So anyway, so that had already been a huge hit, and and I'm on this session with these guys, and so so Tom Fly has this microphone in his hand, this dynamic mic, and he says to me. Never put this microphone on a bass drum. And I said, why is that? He says, because it'll overload. <clears throat> and I'm listening to what he says, right? And so then uh, that day, it was that day that Al Grundy was explaining to us about microphones. And he says, he says, the thing about a dynamic mic is, it, he said, short of putting it, tw tw you know, 24 inches from a bomb, he says, you can't overload it. You can't overload dynamic mics, right? So, okay, now he's telling us that. And now I'm at the studio that night with Tom Fly, and he's telling me you can't use this dynamic mic, you know? So I didn't say, you know, I knew to keep my mouth shut, so I didn't say, believe it or not. But anyway, so I I, uh, I didn't say anything to Tom Fly, but uh, the next day at school, I said to Al, I said, Al, listen, you know what you taught us yesterday? <clears throat> I said, last night I was at the record plant. And he says, well, he says, listen, he says, get used to the fact that a lot of these engineers don't know what they're doing. He said, they're just guessing. And he said, he said, the problem is the mic preamp. He said, he said, whatever mic preamp he's using, he said, he's, that mic is overloading the mic preamp. The mic's not overloading. And this is how these myths get passed around, you know, because it's like, there's, I think there's some, uh. I don't know if he's got any API mic preamps here. Yeah, right there. See those? Mm -hmm. Those things are really high gain. And t they're too high. And and so they're such high gain that if you put a really hot microphone in there, you have to actually put a resistive pad in the line to keep from overloading those things. And that was the case that day, for example. You know, But anyway, there's so many things along these lines that um, so many basics that people don't realize and details. Yeah. The devil's in the details, yeah. you know, I mean, as far as, uh, 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 especially, uh, as far as understanding how, how things interact with each other, the, the, um, see now it's so different with digital. I was going to ask you about digital music, you know, it's, I mean, on one hand we have 
what are supposed to be these nice analog pressings on vinyl. But then you also have the pervasiveness of just digital music in the culture. And, well, you understand you know, <laughs> about the analog records, right? Well, some of them are pressed from digital, so then so it's, they're digital. Yeah. I mean, what what you have a no, but there are CDs with ticks and pops on them. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, in other words, whatever you put into a vinyl cutting lathe, you get out. If you put in analog, you get out analog. If you put in digital, you get that's out right. digital. So that's what a lot of people don't know. You know, I mean, it's kind of a joke, and not such a good joke, really. So the thing is that um, the uh, yeah, I, I I mean, and just let alone this. See, the thing that we're dealing with here, which I was telling that story about analog and digital earlier. Digital is an emotional roadblock, basically. I mean, it, that is what sa- that's what suffers. This has nothing to do with sound, in my opinion. I mean, yes, digital sounds different than analog, but all this stuff about warmth and tubes and it's all it's all in everybody's imagination. I mean, it's what I found is that their dimensionality that's lose, lost. Like when I was initially dealing with the change that happened when I went from analog to digital, I was realizing that there was a certain amount of ambience that went away, a certain amount of that phase information, the stuff that's, that's what happens with an MP3 is that that 90% of the information that's thrown in the trash or 87% or whatever it is, that's all the dimensional information, the height, the width, the depth, that's what goes away first because it's the most you know, computer intensive, you know. And so <clears throat> that's the big problem. I mean, and so the, the, this, if you, ex- I would exaggerate things that I know I was going to, I studied what was going to change and what was going to get lost. And I would exaggerate those things. Uh, and I would do a separate mix. I, like when we were still cutting vinyl records, I would have the mix for analog, and then I would do a separate mix for digital that that trying to take it. It was kind of a very difficult... I mean, I could only do that because I was vice president of a record company, but I mean, but the thing... Or that I own my own studio, but, the, but you couldn't normally have the budget to do that. But I did it anyway because I was trying to learn, right? And And it did work up to a point, but... What I realized was it was the emotional disconnect that was bothering me, and it's and and it's funny because it's more noticeable to me on DVDs than it is on CDs. I mean, on movies because movies are so much about emotion. I mean, music of totally it's totally emotion too. But like if you think about the scoring on a film, I don't mean the songs that are in the soundtrack, but the scoring. Scoring is like an emotional trigger, and so it's meant to be right, and so you can tell how that doesn't, it's like I've noticed that a movie that might move you to tears, when you see a DVD of it, it doesn't have the same effect on you. And and that's why that box that I've got, the minute you turn that on, it's just like it's analog all of a sudden and it affects you the same way. But so this is what I've been spending the last 25 years on this technology real field because I have come up with a solution. I mean, it's and and the problem is that everybody thinks it doesn't matter, you know. Like nobody gives a damn. Everybody says, right? Well, that's not exactly true. But I mean, of course, you got your niche market, the audiophiles and that stuff. But given the choice, people do seem to care, and so that's my thing is to figure out how to getting this into the marketplace is the tricky part, you know. But um, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, but details. Yeah, there's that. And the other thing that, see, a lot of people don't realize, I'll give you another example about details. Okay, so <clears throat> it's called the proximity effect, right? So cardioid capsules or directional capsules, they're called pressure gradient transducers, the capsule, right? So a true pressure transducer is a omni capsule, right? And a pressure gradient transducer is a cardioid capsule. So it has these vents in the back of it and the sound goes around and it cancels when it comes in the back and it's how it makes it directional. So the the sound coming from the rear of the microphone goes in there and it cancels out when it when it, go, it comes around and gets into the front. But the closer you get to those pressure gradient microphones because of the nature of the directionless the, this, how the low frequencies are not directional, the low frequencies will build up, right? So, 
Okay, so now I'm I take the job at the Village Recorder, and they've got this really good file cabinet that has all these technical bulletins and all this stuff. And and I find this Stephen Temer that's a Gotham Audio that you know the the Gotham Audio distributed Neumann microphones after Telefunken. Telefunken had the U, original U forty sevens had a Telefunken badge on them. That was a licensing deal with Neumann. And then Steve Temer came along and started Gotham Audio and distributed uh, Neumann microphones in the United States. Telefunken lost their thing. And that's why Telefunken went to AKG and asked them to build a replacement for the U-47. And that's the ELAM 251, which nobody would buy because it wasn't a 47. It's a way better mic, but nobody would buy it, right? They only made, they made 5,000 of them. That's it. Where there were 100,000 U-47s made. So in any event... Uh, I see this bulletin and it talks about a U67 and it says at, at an inch and a half, 50 hertz is up 18 dB. And I'm reading this and I'm saying, what? You know, 18 dB? I mean, and, and, and so so now what happened by accident was when I was doing You're So Beautiful with Joe, when I was work, the very first time I worked with Joe Cocker, if you've ever seen like Mad Dogs and Englishman or a, any footage of Joe Cocker singing, he didn't keep his head still and sing into the microphone. His head was moving around all over the bloody place, right? And so that doesn't work very well when you get close to a microphone. So what I did was I took a microphone and put it on a stand. I didn't even plug a wire into it, and I told him he could bump his chin on it. And then I put another microphone about 12 inches away and figured that it was far enough away that when he moved around that it would it would uh you know it would solve that problem which it did and it worked great but what else happened was i noticed this clarity and i was like wow that sounds way better way better and so i but it didn't dawn on me it should have but it didn't that was the proximity effect thing. So the minute I read this thing, I went out and started to do some experiments. Now, here's what's really interesting about it. So if you don't know this and you're not thinking about this, now you take this microphone that you're an inch and a half away from and you're singing in and you plug this thing into a compressor. What's going to happen is that low frequency bump is going to cause the compressor to engage and you're going to and it's going to suck some energy out of this vocal that unless you roll that bottom off before it gets to the compressor but the here's the problem and i watched this with you know because i was chief engineer and like i was a second engineer for a few months and i watched what people did what happens is that you put the person in front of the mic and then the engineer thinks to themselves well this sounds kind of dark, you know, and they start adding 5K or 10K or 7K or whatever it is. So now what you got is you got a bump on the bottom and now you got a bump up there somewhere, wherever you've decided, right? And now you got this trough in the middle kind of. Now what you really want to do is roll that bump off and leave the rest of it alone, right? And now you're golden, but that isn't the way people do things, right? And so, you know, I mean... That was a big, huge revelation. And then that's when I started to get in. I never, you know, I literally don't put a microphone closer than six feet to anything anymore. I mean, I haven't for years. I mean, and, and I got into miking zones of the room. This is something that Keith Richards was into. Like, he, he was saying that, he said, you know what doesn't get captured in a recording is the energy that's going on between people. And he said, and so we started to do mic zones of the room. And so you want to hear something really out there? 25 years into making records this one day. Well, well, what happened was we're at his house and we've set up this little studio and I've got a stereo Neumann SM2 microphone and I record this rehearsal with four musicians, right? It's Hubert Sumlin and Keith and Blondie Chaplin and George Roselli, the four of them. And uh, they're on one end of the room and there's a pool table and then I'm on the other end of the pool table with the microphone. The microphone's just like, 12 inches above the pool table, stereo mic. We record it onto a DAP machine, right? And we listen back to this thing and we thing and we just go, whoa, does this sound good? I mean, listen to the stereo imaging and all this stuff. And we were just like flipping out how good it sounds. So anyway, we listen to this 
you know, we were just listening to it, not for sound, because just for routining for the songs, for the rehearsal. It was a rehearsal for a recording session. So anyway, so, um, but then Keith and I got into the sound of it. So everybody left, and he said to me, let's let's go listen to that again. And he says to me, um, hey, he said, uh, what, what if we put up two more microphones? Um, he said, let's put up two more microphones and that mic, and let's see what happens. I met Ron Malo, who was worked at Chess Records, and he recorded the Stones at Chess Records. They did 19 songs there in two days on a four track. And that was Rolling Stones now and 12 by five, those two American records. And, uh, and there are a couple other songs added to that. But anyway, um, and he, and so he was telling me these stories about that. And I was a big Stones fan. And then afterwards he, he told me this other story and he says, uh, he says, Rob, here's a, something you might be interested in. And he said, um, he said, you know, when we were recording Muddy Waters and, Alan Wolf and Chuck Berry and all that. He said, you know, we'd put the band out in the room and he said, we'd put a microphone in front of the vocalist and, it, and, and so we'd be in the control room and we would turn that microphone up and we would listen. And then whatever we didn't hear enough of, that's where we put the other two mics. Now, I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. I'm using 25 microphones. It's like, what do you mean, 26 and 27? You know what I mean? Like, what, what other two mics, right? And I was too embarrassed to ask him what he meant, right? I carried this fucking story around in my head for 25 years, always wondering what he was talking about. And then when Keith said that that night to me, I was like, oh, oh my God. I got the goose. I just get the goosebumps right now thinking about this. I mean, so anyway, so then I said to Keith, oh my God, I told him the whole story. And he remembered Ron Malo from Chess and everything. And he goes, that's fucking interesting. And I said, yes, it is. And, I, and so then what I did the next day, and this is what I was saying, it took me 25 years. So I thought about this that night. And when, I, and when we came the next day, I said to Keith, I got an idea. I said, I, I said I'm going to take a Sharpie and a tape measure and, and, a, and a roll of masking tape. And I'm going to have you guys play. And I'm going to walk around this room for a half an hour in little baby steps. And every time I find a spot that it sounds good, I'm going to get up on my toes. I'm going to crouch down to the floor. I'm going to put an X on the floor, and then I'm going to measure from my floor to from my ear to the floor and write that down on the masking tape. And there was one spot that was definitely the sweet spot. So that's where the stereo mic was put, right? And then we did that very thing. So we'd turn on the stereo mic. They would play. We didn't have a separate control room or anything. But anyway, so we played the thing back, and I said to the engineer, I said, okay, See that X over there near the piano? I said, put a microphone on that X over there. And I said, and that, and that over there, you know, next to where the bass amp is, I said, put an X mic on that X. And this is how we would do it. And, and so we would, and those were actually zones where these Xs were. And so we would mic the zones of the room and it worked just like a charm. It was like, and when you listen back to the recordings, they're so visceral, like they affect your body. They're three-dimensional. It's like, unbelievable i mean and so this became my new thing and i got really good at it and i was make i mean we won a grammy keith and i and that was five microphones a stereo sm2 and four chefs mics and that's it and the whole recording i mean you know and when we did overdubs we overdubbed some horns and stuff we just used that stereo mic and what i learned was you couldn't move that stereo mic even a 16th of an inch because what you were doing was you were overlaying the sound of the overdubs on top of this original corning, recording. And if you move that microphone, it would blur the image because it was now a tiny bit different distance from the walls and the ceiling. I, you couldn't, that mic could not be touched. You know, we ended up putting something around it so nobody could get near it, right? And so anyway, and that's how we did the overdubs. And then you just would put them in the room where you wanted to appear in the stereo mix. And that was fascinating, right? That's amazing. But that's um, so simple. We'll do one last question. Ad advice for young people who are into producing engineering. Advice for young people. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what. I think that the one thing that I learned was uh, I, I found out that I was making timeless records after about five records in, and I started to wonder why. And, um, and I started really thinking about it, and I realized that I made all the decisions I made when I was producing a record based upon feel, not upon technical perfection. And, um, 
And that was a big difference over the, a lot of other people, right? Not everybody, right? I mean, some of the great people that I was around, they were all about Phil. I mean, Phil Spector, Brian Wilson. I mean, I could go on. But the point is that as a young person, you got to remember that it's recording. You can get so wrapped up in the process of it. And, you know, and then, and there's a fear element in the, a lot of, a lot of people are afraid of doing things wrong or, you know, other people are just so irreverent that they are on the other side of the coin and maybe that's a better way to be, I don't know, but it's just the other side of the coin. But the thing is that you want to have, you want to basically um, have a criterion and that's why I'm saying feel is the best criterion and simplicity is the other thing. And uh, because you're going to get convinced that you need all these things that you don't really need. And it's funny that I've gone back to recording in the simplest possible way with the fewest pieces of equipment. And it's so amazing and so much easier. And the thing is, the focus stays on the music instead of the technical aspects of things. Because it is so tempting to go down this technology road and get so lost in it that you forget you're making music, you know? And I think that would be the biggest thing. And and I would say, you know, this whole digital analog thing is too long of a discussion for a sentence like this, but I, I mean, I would take a look at that. I would kind of compare, see the problem now you've got at a live gig is you got, if, you, if you're at a gig, if you're just listening to people play music and there's no PA system, that's one thing. But the minute you've got a console now, you've got a digital console. So you're already, the waters have been muddled, you know? I mean, it's like, I don't know. what. You, I mean, the only reference point you're going to have is just, I mean, I would say take, a, take a, 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 an acoustic guitar and a voice. Let's just say this, right? Or whatever, or a drum and a voice, or a piano or whatever, just an, one instrument and a voice. And, and have that person play and listen to it and calm down, you know, relax and just don't feel like you're trying to do anything. Just sit there and listen and soak it up and, and, and try to get into the lyrics and the, you know, the whole emotion of what you're hearing, then try recording it and listen back to it and see if it has the same effect on you. I'd say for starters, that might be a good idea, right? And then based upon, upon what you find out doing that, that'll inform what you're going to do next. Amazing. That's Thank a, you, Rob. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs>